information somewhere in the middle. Now, within these different types of analysis, you'll see lots of different terminologies. Um, some of the ones we're going to look at very briefly today will be IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, in vivo coding, where we use the participants' own words to create codes and themes, thematic analysis, discourse analysis, and there are many, many more. Um, so we're just going to cover some of the basics of some of these approaches, but there are so many different ways that we can interpret the data. It's worth going out and looking for some of the different ones, some of the, the more common ones. One of the things that I always like to stress about qualitative analysis is it's very rare that you would just go through and do the analysis and code it once and come with up with an answer in the end. Usually it's part of an iterative process. And by that, I mean one where we have to keep going back to the start, looking through it again. And each time we go through the data, we'll find new things. So it's important to stress to people who've not done it before that qualitative analysis can be a very time consuming process. It's not the kind of thing that you can do quickly in 10 or 15 minutes before the assignment's due. It's something that might take days or weeks or even months for very large projects. So just bear in mind that sometimes you can even get stuck. Sometimes you could try one type of coding approach and it's not working for you or it's not working for the data. You need to go back and try something else. So be prepared that it's not always a linear process. It's very difficult to gauge how long it's going to take. So today we'll look at some of the useful features that we have in the software that can kind of help us with this process. So we'll look at managing the codes and themes. Uh, when the, the question that we always get asked is, how many is the right number of codes? When do we have too many or too few? We'll look at some, some of the ways that we can answer that question uh, and ways that we can merge and split our codes so we can end up bringing themes together or finding particular things that we want to make more varied. And we'll also look at different ways to read the data. So reading across the themes, everything on a particular theme, reading across the sources and also reading across the different groups. I'll describe what we mean by all those soon. So today I'm going to demonstrate Quercos, which is our software package. There are many others out there. Um, what makes Quercos different is um, basically it's uh, designed just for working with text data. So it doesn't have as many features as some of the other packages out there. Um, our focus really is on ease of use, so something that's quite simple, very quick to use, was originally developed for participatory analysis, so where we could actually have people involved in the, da in, in the data collection, uh, people being interviewed for the data, interpret the data themselves and see how they want to do it. And it's moved on quite a bit from there, but it meant that we have to design something that was very visual, very easy if you've not done qualitative analysis before. And that's still where uh, we find ourselves kind of the most popular. Um, the software is identical on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, I'm actually on Linux today, but it doesn't make any difference um, which operating system you're using. Uh, and I'll talk about the difference between the offline and the cloud versions as well. Um, but basically, there's there's no differences in the different software. And the word quirkos comes from the, the Greek word kirklos, which is the root of the English word circle. Uh, people often ask, so it's nice to say. So this is the interface that we'll show you. Um, and the codes and themes that we create are represented by these bubbles. The bubbles grow when you add text to them, so that gives you a very uh, engaging live view of what's happening as you go through and code your data. There are lots of visualizations which help you show connections between the themes and connections between different parts of the data. Um, and the themes and codes allow us to tag across the sources. Um, we can use them in any way, they're very flexible tools. So we can use them for theory building, grounded theory, descriptive work, uh, and also meta categories as well. And I'll talk about how those are useful as well. There's also opportunities for doing reflexive writing. So we have memos, uh, which allow you to kind of write analytic text specifically for each different segment of your own data. Um, you can use them for your own reflexive comments. So for recording your own process, uh, and your own thoughts and feelings about the data, things that you might want to come back to later, things that you don't understand. And you can also have discussions with other researchers if you're working on the project. There's also a chat function, which is more useful when you have lots of people kind of working on the project at the same time, you can ask people questions, but you can also use it to keep your uh, research journal. By that, I mean kind of a diary about how you're interpreting the data as you go along, uh, different decisions that you're making, and having that reflexive process can really help in the writing out later. 
So that's all the slides I have for today. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of the time demonstrating the software, demonstrating some of those different types of coding um, with the software itself. So this is the software. Um, you can download it from our website, um, which is www.quercos.com. There's a free trial of both the cloud version, which requires an ongoing subscription, and the offline version, which is based on a, a, a permanent license. Um, I should note the prices you see on the website, there's also an additional 25% discount for um, emerging economies. Um, so Quercos you'll probably also already find is about half the price of other software options, but there are additional discounts available. And please let me know if you have any questions or discussions for them. Um, you're welcome to kind of follow along um, doing it yourself if you want to, or um, come back and, and watch the recording at some other time. But there's also lots of tutorials and video guides on our website. So if you ever get stuck when you're trying it out for yourself, all the resources are available. You don't need to register or pay anything to access any of the training materials and guides and, and example data sets that we're going to use today. So when you start Quercos, you'll have two different options. So there'll be the option to sign in if you're using the cloud account, and that's what I'm going to do now. But there's also the option here to uh, continue with local storage, and that's the offline mode. In the cloud storage mode, everything is stored on our own uh, servers. Uh, we have one based in South Asia as well. And what that means is that all the data is stored on the server, and whichever computer you log into, your data is there. So it's standard kind of cloud service. But it also means that you can collaborate live in real time with people across the world. So lots of people could be working on the project at the same time. If you prefer just to keep the data on your computer, uh, especially if you have uh, problems with intermittent in internet access, you can always use the offline version. And that just stores the data in a small project file on your own computer. So I will just log in here. Um, After I've logged in, what I'll see here is um, a list of all the different projects which I've created here or imported. And there's also a list here of projects which have been shared with me. So other people have been working on projects uh, they want me to work on and they've shared those with me. And by double clicking on any of these projects, I can just open them up and continue working with them. But what I'm going to do first is show you um, how to create a new project and bring in your data once you're ready. So to do that, I just click on the new project button. We have to create a project first before we can bring in data because everything is stored in one project file, even when you're working on the cloud. So I'll create the project title here. Um, we'll take an example project. There's the option here to password protect the file for working with confidential data, need to secure that, and also to have structured questions. And we're not really going to look at this today. The structured questions are for uh, when you're importing data from something like an online survey and you have it in database form, uh, or spreadsheet format. And that means um, you have kind of set questions, open-ended questions uh, in, in a survey, which may be mixed methods, so discrete questions, as well as open-ended qualitative questions. So I'm going to click on the new project button here again. Now we've given it the title and we're ready to go with our qualitative example project. What you'll see from the layout here is the left side of the screen is split to where we'll create our codes and themes, and the right side of the screen is where we'll bring in our text sources. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring in the sources of data that I want to analyze for my research project. And the data that I'm going to be looking at today is actually one of our example projects. Mm -hmm. So we have um, a whole bunch of uh, free resources on our website, including real qualitative research projects, that you can download and try for yourself. This is one of them. Uh, it's a project where we've actually interviewed um, qualitative researchers um, about their, so senior qualitative researchers, professors, about their careers in qualitative research. Um, so it's a, a little bit of a meta project, um, but it's something that pretty much everybody can engage with if, while you're learning kind of qualitative skills. So to bring in those sources of data, I've already downloaded them from our website. I'll click on this click to add source button at the top right of the screen here. And this brings in the data here. We've got certain options so we can create a, a blank source in which we can write. So if we want to create data that way, 
We can import data from clipboard, so we can copy and paste from anything we can see on our computer. So another project file, maybe a website or something like that. We can import data from a spreadsheet file, so a CSV file. We can also bring in a whole folder of sources at once. I'm just going to select files here. Now remember, Quercos will only work with um, text files. So the options you have are natively anywhere. Uh, text files, rich text files, uh, PDF files, and docx files. What that means is when I'm talking about PDF files, you can also bring in literature as well. So you can use this kind of software for doing a literature review or a systematic review. That's a very powerful way to, to do that. I'll hopefully talk about that a little bit later. So here are the sources that I want to bring in. These are transcripts of semi-structured interviews. So we've uh, done these interviews with professors and we've recorded them. And then they've gone to a transcription service and they've come back, every word is typed out. So I'm going to select all of these, click on open. Uh, seven sources have been successfully imported. Okay, so the data has been brought in. You can see on the right side of the screen, this is the text for this tab up here. Bruce, one of the people, uh, the, the names have been anonymized, they're not their real names. Um, what I'm just going to do here very quickly is just increase the text size so it's a bit easier for you to see. I'm just going to click on the settings button, general project preferences, and then here increase the size of the text. And that makes it a bit easier to see. And by dragging this slider here left and right, I can change the, the width of the, uh, the text so we can start working. So um, these tabs across the top of the screen here allow us to move through some of the sources. So the last three sources that we've worked with in the project. And this button here shows all of the sources in the project. Um, so I can click on any of these, so maybe I'll choose David. Uh, um, and here's, here's an interview, David, and we can read that text. So we'll go back to Matilda. Maybe we'll start with Matilda's source today. Okay. Uh, now we've brought in those sources of text. We can start coding. We can start working with them. But in Quercos, there are different ways in which we can categorize, group, and set attributes and properties of these sources. What I mean by that is different ways that we can distinguish between the different types of participants in our data. And we do that with the second row of tabs here, which is for the source properties. And we use the source properties for anything that we might know about the source, about the participant that might be interesting. So often this will be demographic data. So it may be age, gender, location, um, part of a control group. So, you know, uh, whether they were um, in a particular part of the research project, maybe even the date they were interviewed and who they interviewed them. So any of these are source properties that we can define. And you'll see later on, we can use those very powerfully to explore the differences between groups of our participants. So I'm gonna click here on the little plus button at the bottom. And this will create a new property. Uh, we're gonna create one which is called uh, age. And we'll say that Matilda is uh, 52. And now we've created a property which is age and a value for this particular person, Matilda, that's 52. And we'll create another one as well, and we'll say location, this has been Australia. That's another property that we have, and the value is uh, Australia for this particular person. And we can create as many of these as we like. They're very useful when you're doing a bibliographic data, if you're doing a, a, a literature review or a systematic review. Um, and you can change it at any time and they can be anything. You can even have long comments about the source or the interview process here. They can be numeric, they can be discrete, and you can also have multiple options for each of them. So the location, you could have multiple locations where the person worked in their past, for example. So now if I go to David, I can choose the age of this person. I can say that they are 39, their location, is Scotland. So, um, by doing this, later on we'll be able to see, for example, all the people who are in one location, uh, or all the people who are in 
of, over a particular age or under a particular age and see if there are any differences between those groups of people. We don't have to do this now. And if we have this data already um, in something like Excel as a spreadsheet, we can just import that without having to type everything out. But for now, that just kind of demonstrates how we can use the software to kind of sort and categorize our data. I also find it really helpful to use this to manage the, the data collection process. So I will create sources um, for people who I haven't even interviewed yet. And I can have fields in the source properties for interview date. And if I have permission slips back for them, um, and if I've got contact details for them and so on. So I can keep any detail I have about my participants here, but it can really help not just the analysis, but the whole kind of process of collecting research data. So I'm going to click on the tab here to go back to the text, go back to Matilda. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to go through the text and we're going to see what we can find in the data. Uh, we're going to start creating codes and themes. Um, and then I'm going to show you how that would differ if we were doing different types of analysis. Okay. So what I'm going to do is read through this first paragraph here. Um, so you can see we've got the, the questions from the interviewer here, and then we've got their responses here. And we also have timestamps in here. So this allows us to sync it up to the audio. Um, so the respondent says, Matilda says, I have a very messy work history is usually how I tried to explain it. So my PhD was originally in English literature. I did that a very long time ago. I think I finished it in about 96 and worked for about 10 years as a casual lecturer and teaching courses and university courses and literary studies and cultural studies, film studies, gender studies, a whole range of things, a bit like a university release leaf teacher used to be now. I tell myself that I was at the forefront of the applicant academic precipitate and gig economy, which is not a good thing. So I didn't have any word for it back then. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Just this, this paragraph, there's a lot of interesting things that we might want to be coding. So the first thing she says is, I have a very work, messy work history. Um, so I could drag and drop that onto a bubble here. Um, and I could create a theme which kind of summarizes this idea. Um, we're going to call this for now varied work. We could call it messy work, but I think for now we'll call it varied work. So my PhD was originally in English literature and I did that a very long time ago. Okay, so I'm going to be quite interested probably in PhDs. It's a lot, something a lot of our uh, respondents are going to talk about. So I'm going to drag and drop that code onto the plus button here to create a new theme, which is called PhD studies. There's space here also for a description. So if it wasn't clear what we meant by that, um, we could write that there. It's pretty clear for PhD studies, but that might be different for different programs. So we might want to clarify what we mean by that there. There's also the option here to change the color of the bubble that represents the code. We'll just change that to yellow for now. Oh, the other one was yellow. I shouldn't have done that. Anyway. Um, now this text is also about something else. So they also mention uh, English literature. Um, so I'm gonna drag and drop this text again onto the plus button and create a code called English literature. It might be interesting to see how many of our participants either had training or background in English literature or uh, mentioned it in some other way in, during the data. And so now you can see here, we've got three codes that we've created so far. We've got one on PhD studies I can click and drag and move these around the screen. I've got one for varied work and one for English literature. Now, I'm actually going to create another theme here just by clicking on the plus button and call this disciplines. I mean, academic. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that although I've got English literature here, in the future I'm going to have lots of other themes as well. So I'm just zooming in so you can see that a little bit better. So I'm gonna create another theme here called um, health, uh, we see that business studies, another code called sociology. But here I'm anticipating codes that I might create in, in the future. So in other words, I'm creating codes. 
And what I'm going to do is start creating some groups or subcategories to keep these together. Already this is getting a little bit messy here. So for our disciplines here, we'll drag the English literature bubble onto disciplines. And so now English literature is a subcategory of our disciplines code. We'll make health a subcategory and sociology and business studies as well. Now we could also, if we double click on the code here, you'll see now, once we double click on the code, we start to see all the text which has been assigned to any of these codes, even the subcategories. And if we just want to see one of them, for example, English literature, we'll click on that one. But we can also create another theme here. So we'll create one which is called, um, we can create one which is called social sciences. The reason for that is we could have sub subcategories here. If we go back to the main view, now see in English literature we have social sciences okay it doesn't belong there so we just pull these out to drag them out we'll create social sciences as a bigger category there uh, and we'll pull out sociology and we'll put that now into our social sciences category so now we've rethought our groupings there and we've created some sub subcategories so now you can see that under social sciences have sociology as social science and we could create various others as well. So the ability to create groups and manage these codes and themes in this way will be very useful as we get later on into the process. It will allow us to see in great detail how we can rethink our codes and our themes and how we're working with the data and how we're kind of defining things. So let's look a little bit more about the what the person is saying here. Uh, I think I finished about 96, I went for about 10 years as a casual lecturer in teaching courses, university courses. So create another theme here, casual work. What's the age of yellow today? Literary, literary studies, cultural studies, film studies, gender studies, a whole range of things. Now these are all talking, these are all kind of um, social sciences to a certain extent. Um, so I'm going to put that in the social sciences theme that we had here. Um, I tell myself I was at the forefront of academics with that gig economy, which is not a good thing, so I didn't have a word for it back then. So they're saying they didn't really have a permanent contract. They weren't in a kind of tenure track position. So this is interesting. This is kind of about varied work. It's kind of about casual work as well. Um, and we're also going to call this job insecurity. What you can see here We've got very, so many shades of yellow today, sorry about this. Let's change one of them. We'll right click here on one of the bubbles and choose edit. And we'll change casual work from being yellow to being purple. Uh, yes, okay, in orange. Okay, so uh, varied work, casual work and job security. So you can see just this sentence here, we've actually found a lot of interesting things here. Uh, job insecurity, casual work and varied work. So it's it's, possible in any of the qualitative software, but especially in Quercos, to have one piece of text belong to multiple codes. When that happens, you get these color-coded stripes along the side here that show you, and you can hover your mouse over them, which piece of text has been added to which code. You can change your mind at any time. You can right-click on a highlight, click remove highlight, and then that piece of text is no longer assigned, and you see our varied work bubble got a bit smaller. We'll click on the undo button now. We've got undo and redo buttons, so you can always change your mind and go back to an earlier version of the project. So let's have a little look now. Um, we looked at, I think, just two sentences of the data. It probably took us about 10 minutes. And we created one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 codes. We could probably do a lot more. This is also about casual work. Um, so yes, we, we can go through and explore this in great depth. And this is one of the, I hope this is illustrative as to how long sometimes qualitative analysis can take, because there could be so many things that you're interested in. Now for this project, it's just an example one. We haven't set a kind of research question, so it's not really very clear exactly what things are going to be relevant. Maybe we're interested in career journeys. Maybe we're interested in the different disciplines. Maybe we're not. Maybe we're only interested in the element of job security and how people see academia as being a good employee. 
a good employer, sorry, or a good place to work. So depending what our research questions is, what our topics and themes are, this will give us a lot of clearer idea than this example about what our codes and themes should be. And in general, they should always be helping you to answer your research question. And so what we would do now is we would go through and we would read through the data until we'd read this whole interview, which is, how long is this, an hour long? And so each of these, I think, are about an hour long. Um, and we would see, um, create, keep creating codes and themes. Um, sometimes we would merge them together. Sometimes we would work with them in different ways. We would keep going through and interpreting the data and seeing how it looked in these different ways. So this is the process that takes a long time in quality analysis, the very laborious process of going through nearly line by line and deciding what people are talking about. Now, I'm just going to quickly go over a couple of ways, other ways that we can explore the data. Um, and one of those, for example, would be to use the text search. So if there were particular words or themes that we we're looking for, we can search for those in the text and we can add them to a particular code or create a code which we want to uh, create, add those that text to. So I'll click here on this magnifying glass button, that's the search button, and it opens the search term here um, and we put in sociology. And we have 20 occurrences of the word sociology. And this is not just through one of those interviews, this is across all of the interviews that we brought in. So it's actually not very many, actually, surprisingly. Um, so this person says, and a master's degree in sociology, and then I worked, okay, worked where? We don't see that. So every time we see a research result here, we can load a little bit more of the search here with this. So now we can see the whole thing. Uh, I did at one time do what my mother terms a proper job. I did a degree, a master's degree in sociology, I worked for six years in the National Health Services General Manager. Good. So I select that whole piece of text and I can add that onto the sociology bubble. Okay. So it's very easy to code from this. And then the same person again, the uh, person who would become my supervisor was at that time reading sociology. And sociology is interested in technology, all kinds of technology. Okay, great. So we'll add that to the sociology category again. So we just hover the mouse over and these subcategories pop out. We'll also add this into technology. So we'll add this onto the plus button here, create new own technology. Because maybe that's going to be useful in the future. So, so we can go through and read through all of these. Now the search bar can be more powerful as well. You can use synonyms. I'm not sure it's going to have any for no, sociology. So if there are alternative words that you can think of. And you can also filter. So you might just want to see results from just people who are a particular age or in a particular location. You could also just get example words which appeared in the text that you've coded. So if we just choose the coded text only, it will only show us text that comes from um, sources that we've already coded. We've not done that work so far. So this can be a useful kind of shortcut to some of the approaches, some of the coding approaches. But it's also important to bear in mind that for qualitative research, this is quite a limited way to work. So one of the things that we are interested in is insecurity, the so job insecurity. Um, and let's just start this again. Right, and if we search for insecurity, okay, nobody used that particular term. So it's not very helpful to us to search for that term, even though job insecurity is one of the ways we would do it. Somebody mentioned it being uh, precarious work. So that was a word that might come up once, the risk of using a particular keyword is that if somebody uses a different term, a different phrase, a different word, it won't show up in this search. And so you might have missed something that was relevant to that. And that's kind of why generally in qualitative analysis, you do need to read through everything and make sure you've kind of tried to get it in as many different categories as possible before you rely on the text search. Now, there are certain things where it can work very well. So places is a great example of this. So if we wanted to see every time somebody mentions the word Australia, great. Okay, well, yes, it's Matilda. She comes from Australia. Um, so that's that's very clear. She's unlikely to use another term for Australia. You know, you know, there are, she might be talking about a particular region or something. So 
that can be useful, but it's something that you shouldn't really rely on too much for most qualitative analysis approaches. So speaking of different qualitative analysis approaches, let's look at some of the other ways that we can annotate the data and some of the other types of analysis that we can do. So far, we've been doing a kind of basic coding approach, um, but there are two other approaches that are very commonly used, uh, which require us to uh, write rather than code and work on a line by line basis. And those are IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis, um, and in vivo coding. Both of these tend to work line by line through the data um, and use the participants' own words, this is what in vivo means, from, from their own text, from their own life, to describe what's going on. So what I could do, uh, for example, is I will use this memos column here to, to do this approach. So now we're not going to create any more codes and themes. We can take a different approach uh, and use uh, reflexive writing, interpretive analytic writing to interpret the data. So just choose another sentence here. So I did freelance editing alongside it. So quite a mix of things along the way. So we can add this to, we just click and drag some text, add it to the memo column here. And it's kind of like writing a little post-it note or kind of scribbling in the margin here. Uh, and we'll put in free, Editing. If we want to code that data later on, we just click on the memo, select the text, and we can drag and drop that uh, somewhere else. Um, so quite a mix of things along the way. Mix of things. So we're creating these these different memos here. We can hide, we can go between them, and we're kind of using the participants' own words here. This is in vivo coding to describe the text. Um, and there's particular phrases that I think could be quite kind of psychologically interesting in, in to how they describe themselves. So settling in, um, sort of to what the international PhD students, Australia University, they had a course running for the first semester, settle in and provide more structured background. So I'm going to call this settle in because I think that's kind of a very important phrase that they're talking about, settling in. And I'm going to track this onto casual work because I think that's kind of about that precarious nature uh, and feeling settled. So we can also create a code here for belonging, for example. So you can um, create these mo memos and codes. You can edit them later. So you didn't do very good typing in this one. Um, and what you'd often do in IPA or in vivo coding is go through and create these kind of little memos and notes for each line or each relevant sentence. And then later you would come back and create these codes and themes based on the kind of topics that you were finding in your reflexive notes. But you can also use it for commenting to yourself. So um, find something uh a series of different contracts in that various you know messy combinations of things so we can drag and drop this here so we can say second time she's used the term messy it's, it's significant so you, we're, we're starting to get almost a psychological profile of this person now that they, they see their career as being something that was messy so it doesn't feel like this person was preordained to be a qualitative researcher or preordained to be in academia. They didn't have this um, very direct career strategy. It feels like it, it's kind of happened random to them. So this is this is quite interesting for our research topic anyway. Um, and so I'm writing these things here. Um, and you can even have, you can even have, I often use this to kind of like, especially if I'm collaborating with people, things I don't understand. So what does researcher developer mean? Is that someone that trains researchers? I've not heard that phrase before. So maybe that's something I want to think about, go back or, or ask the, the participant or ask someone else what that terminology, what that phrase means. Uh, and again, these memos kind of help me annotate the text and keep different things in the forefront. So, the next thing I want to talk about is um, 
developing codes into themes. So very many different kinds of um, grounded theory, for example, will talk about different stages um, where you have sometimes called open codes or axial codes. Um, and you'll have codes and then themes, sometimes called different things. Generally, what they refer to are codes being quite basic descriptive categories. So very literal things like technology, PhD studies, uh, disciplines. And then the themes, uh, the higher order codes, sometimes also called the axial codes, will be where those codes come together and start to be something that's a little bit more uh, theoretical, something a little bit more abstract, something that is a slightly wider category. And uh, the best example I kind of have of that so far in this very small example, um, are these, these codes here. So some of these codes are probably more like themes. This sense of belonging, in fact, let's change this to belonging in academia, because it's a little bit more specific about what we're talking about. We want to kind of understand possibly what things make people feel like they belong in academia, that they work in academia, somewhere that they want to be. They also might be um, issues or problems that they've had. Um, certainly for this person here, as we're developing this, this psychological profile of her messy career, her sense of belonging is something that's it's beginning to emerge from the data as quite a strong theme. And if other people are talking about this in the same way, then this is something that's definitely going to be significant for answering our research question uh, and something that we want to look at later on. So I'm starting just in the canvas here to put these codes close together because they're not really subcategories, but they are all kind of connected in some ways. I've got a lot of people talking about casual work so far. Lots of, well, just this one person actually, but we have, they've made lots of references to casual work. They don't have a permanent position. And I wonder if that's challenging our notion, her, her notion about feeling belonging. Or maybe later in her career, we'll see that this changes. Um, so I'm interested in this and I'm gonna keep these together. These are the kind of things that will develop into themes. And these themes are the kind of things that will get closer to answering our research questions. In the case of grounded theory, generating new theory. By that I mean new ideas, new ways to look at the world uh, new hypotheses that might help us to understand a complex phenomenon that we're investigating with qualitative data. So that's a very basic overview of kind of what we mean by codes and themes. And what we'll find as we go through the work is often we'll change our mind about what these things mean. So is there really a difference between job insecurity and casual work? It may be that we later on describe that, decide that these are really kind of facets of the same thing. So what I could do is I could right click on job insecurity, oops, sorry. And I could merge this into casual work. And so that will put all of the codes which I had in the um, job insecurity theme and put them into the casual work theme. And this is a very common thing that we'll want to do. You can see with this, you know, we've looked at one paragraph of the data. and We've created, you know, nearly 10 or 15 codes now. When you've gone through all of the interviews, you may have dozens and dozens or hundreds of these codes. And it's very common that you'll later decide that things that were phrased slightly differently or you interpreted slightly differently for one particular participant ended up kind of meaning the same thing. And so what we will probably do in that stage is create them into a co a theme, so something that's a little bit more abstract, a little bit more higher order, and merge those codes together. And that way uh, we can create uh, much more um, connections across the different data sets. Now you might ask, you know, why don't we just get those right the first time? Um, yes, that would be a lot easier, but often it's not always clear what these themes will become the first time they're mentioned. And so it's a good idea I always say about codes to create them early, um, but write them in pencil. So what I mean by that is don't be too wedded to particular terminology. We have this phrase here, this code varied work. Um, it's horrible, actually. So we can change it to um, 
uh, work variety. Maybe that's better. Um, maybe it even means kind of satisfaction. Maybe satis job satisfaction is connected to the variety of work that we have. So don't be afraid to change the codes and themes, change the name of them, change what's in them as you go along. You'll, there'll be this constant process of refining and working with the data a bit more. Okay. So what I'm going to do now um, is um, I'm just going to stop very quickly, just see if we have any questions at this stage. Um, feel free to put them in the chat or, or ask them uh, verbally if you, if you prefer. And then I'm going to come back, show you an example of this project that's been completely coded. And then I'll show you some of the ways that we can explore the coded data. And we can um, look at some of the other features in Quercos, some of the visualizations and some of the reports and things. Okay, so we have a question already. And we made one theme satisfaction and one casual work except exception. So can one theme be used for more than one as a sub theme? Yes, as a sub theme, that's a good idea. Generally, my guidance is, at least initially, try not to have one code um, be too vague, too general, because it's easier to merge than to split things apart. When you split something apart, you need to go through and decide to each extract of text you have in that code, does it belong here or there? So you have to go through and do your decision making again. Whereas the merging, if you have a very specific code uh, and it's too specific, it's easy to merge into something that's more general, more vague. Um, but it's actually more difficult, it's more work to, to merge it, to break it apart. Um, so I hope that answers the question. It's, it's just kind of guidance. Oh yes, sorry, I've, I've, I've got a bit of a typo there as well. Someone's pointed out in the chat. I'm very bad at talk, talking and typing at the same time. So I tend to have very, lots, lots, <laughs> lots of uh, spelling mistakes and things in there as well. So this, all of this is kind of guidance. There's really no kind of real set answer to you know, how many codes you should create, how vague they should be. When you start creating themes from your codes, it depends so much on the data and the research question. So it's a very, a very fluid approach. Oh, can satisfaction be included in more than one theme as a sub theme? Okay, so that's a good, a good point. Um, so here, what we've got here is um, this kind of hierarchical view. So we've got um, sub themes here. Um, but what, what if we wanted to have, um, let's, let's make a better example here. So we have work variety, we need the same colors, it's a completely different one. And then we'll rename this one satisfaction. And we'll have another one here called um, Big K. <laughs> so uh, perhaps we think that good pay is something which is good for satisfaction and work variety. Okay, that's good. But we don't want casual work is likely to be unsatisfaction, but it is kind of connected to satisfaction in some way. Um, so what if we wanted to have casual work be in satisfaction, but also be in problems? Uh, it's not a very good example, but it's, it's kind of difficult to create these on the fly. So we can create it as a subcategory there, but then it can't also belong in satisfaction. This is a good point. So for that purpose, we have the groups. Now groups are non-hierarchical groupings. And in groups, a code can belong to more than one theme. So we'll create one which is called, let's create a, a theme which is called problems. It's probably quite a common way to do it. And we'll have another one which is called insecurity. So if we wanted to show that casual work 
is a problem and it also contributes to insecurity, what we can do is right click, choose edit, and then we can say that casual work belongs to the code, to the group problems and insecurity. And what that means is we've now created this, this other kind of satisfaction and the groups are very useful for creating these high level codes later. Um, and you'll see now we've got problems and insecurity as groups here. Uh, we'll put this in problems as well. We also have about insecurity. Belonging in academia, that's that kind of about insecurity. Okay, it will be for now. So I can tick to see just the codes which belong in one group. So now problems and casual works, are there. casual work is there because they belong to the problem group. And insecurity is casual work and belonging in academia. So these are not very good examples here, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the group function because that means that you can create these groupings which overlap because the casual work belong to both of those groups in a way that you can't create overlapping sub themes with the um, drag and drop sub themes here. I hope that made some kind of sense. Uh, so someone asked the groups that axiom codes or themes, probably more of the themes. So they, you can use them how you like, but generally people will use them kind of at the, the later, the later uh, version. So if you're going from open to axial codes, then the groups and the will be closer to the, um, you start using the groups to create the axial themes, um, those higher level themes. Uh, and someone else asks, can we find correlations between the codes and themes, strength and direction, we de detect patterns in the data or codes? Yes, and I'm gonna demonstrate that um, in a minute, how, how we'll, we can visualize those. Good questions. Has anyone else got any other questions they'd like to ask? Yes, there is one more question they're asking is about the strength and the direction. Uh, it, it is the second part of the same question, Daniel. Can we find the correlations between the codes and themes and strength and direction? Yes, so I'm going to demonstrate that a little later because it's easier to demonstrate in the example project where the coding has been finished. Right. Um, in Quirkos, you can't really show very much of the strength. You can show the strength, you can't really show very much of the direction. Um, but I'll, I'll talk about some of the ways that we can, we can look at that. Okay. And the next question is, can we detect patterns in the data or the codes and or codes? Yes. So, yeah, again, I'm going to show, show, I'm going to demonstrate those things in the next, um, next section. Okay, so I'm going to jump straight into that and I'll start um, showing some of that. So, um, one of the things I should have mentioned about um, how Quirkos works um, is there's no save button. Um, and that's because basically Quirkos is constantly saving the data, whether you're working offline or in the cloud. So after each action, even just moving a bubble, it basically is pressed save for you. So everything is, is saved as it is. What that means is, if you want to capture the project in particular state, so before you tried a particular type of analysis, for example, you need to click on the project button and save as, and so create a copy of that particular stage. Otherwise it's always improving, improving or, or keeping working on the same project. So what that mean, also means is now I'm finished with this, this project for now, um, I don't need to save it. I can just open another project and next time I come back to it, it will be in the same state. So I'm going to choose open new or existing uh, and then I'm going to, I don't think I have this project here, I'll click on upload project. And here's the project I have, qualitative research journeys. Oh. <laughs> okay, so this part, <laughs> this is, I'm going to change the text size here a little bit. Okay, so this is the same project. Um, and the same project, pro project and our, my colleague who worked on this project has now gone through and coded the whole project. 
So this, um, she's looked for different things. Um, I'll have to say that, that first of all. So her codes are not the same as the ones that I were creating in this example. It doesn't really matter. Um, but she's found other things, probably something about satisfaction. I'd be surprised if there wasn't. Um, well, maybe there isn't. Interesting what her unsurprising things are. But she's looked at things like teaching. Um, she's looked at about things changing, different types of research, their first qualitative project. And for this project, because um, she's actually giving a conference presentation tomorrow about this theme, uh, vulnerabilities. So different, different problems and issues that people had specifically about pursuing a career in qualitative research in academia and, and vulnerabilities in academia as well. Um, if I double click on this vulnerabilities theme here, you'll be able to see all of these different subcategories here. So self-belief, denial, uh, training gaps, different expectations. And okay, this here's one of the themes we have, messy, messy journeys. So it wasn't just the one, the Matilda source that we looked at here that also mentioned messy journeys. If we hover our mouse over the messy journeys bubble here, um, so it just popped up then, oh, come back. We can see that um, uh, every, right, yeah, every source here has mentioned um, messy journeys in some way. Uh, and this shows how many quotes. So the first one has one out of 39, three out of 72. So how many quotes there are in each, each source for that messy journeys theme. And by clicking on the messy journeys theme button here, now we can see, oops, sorry, I've just unclicked it. Um, we can see just the text, everything about messy journeys. Um, inside the train, basically they were doing different things. Oh, we looked at that stage. That was one of our messy journey quotes. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can see there's many others here and from lots of different sources as well. Caroline Source, David's, Caroline as well. So they categorize it in different ways. But there's various subcategories here as well, some of which didn't get used in the end. Um, credibility. So these are all the different categories. So some of these, I think, messy journeys, for example, this has become, I think, a little bit more of a, a theme, more of a kind of axial code. Um, credibility. I think credibility is also the, a kind of higher concept. There's probably more of a theme at this stage. Um, where you've got very basic ones like who does the research code? That's probably more of a code, I think. There. So now we've got all this data coded. I'll just click on the home button to go back to our code here. Um, we've got this kind of overview of the project and the different things which have come out here. And what we can do now is start looking to see connections between the data. This is something that somebody was asking for in the questions here. So um, I don't know this data set very well. So let's explore it a little bit. Um, one of the bigger things here is this code, unsurprising. So things that were unsurprising. Um, so what I can do is right click on this unsurprising code and I'll choose the overlap view. And what the overlap view does is it looks at every time somebody used the unsurprising code and what other theme it connects with at the same time. So here's an example. Unsurprising here was also coded together with memo R and who. So um, that's kind of just kind of some process stuff. So who was, it's talking about a particular kind of memo, uh, unsurprising message and purpose of scholarship. So what this shows is the closer that these bubbles go to the center, the more of an overlap there is. So what this is kind of showing here is the most overlap was with the vulnerabilities theme. So this is kind of interesting, actually. So in this data, it's kind of conceptualized that people are not surprised by either their own vulnerabilities or the difficulties that they kind of had in their academic journey. It's almost like they kind of expected them or they, they don't see them to be, um, you know, some, even kind of worth mentioning in some way. What we can do is by clicking on the vulnerabilities bubble, this shows us every instance where we've coded some text to be unsurprising and about vulnerabilities. So Caroline doesn't present qualitative research in opposition to the scientific method, even if many of them have been taught to see it that way. Many are uncomfortable if they've been asked or told to do qualitative research. Acknowledging the value of science and RCTs creates a willingness to open their mind. So they're talking about 
vulnerabilities that, that qualitative research is maybe inferior to the RCT kind of approach, um, but it also seems again that they're not surprised by it. And this is what I mean about using the text to read differently through the data. What we're doing here is reading the connections between vulnerabilities and unsurprising stuff. And by the time we've read through this and done it for all the different people that we have in the project, we'll start to see something about this theme, something something significant that we'll want to talk about and write about, a finding. And these overlap views can be very powerful to help us. Now, the further out we go in this view, the less of an overlap there is. So nobody talked about unsurprising stories or unsurprising things that students enjoy. Um, but people did talk about memo A. I think that's a meta code. I'll talk about this in a minute. Unsurprising self-belief. We can click on any of these bubbles to see. So this is one of the ways that we can start exploring the connections here. And hovering the mouse over every of those will show how many overlapping codes there are, three. So it shows, gives us some indication of, of the strength. And one of the things that I want to stress a little bit when we're talking about, we talked about stress and direction, is that in a lot of qualitative analysis, you shouldn't really draw too much on the numbers, so the instances of the codes. Depending on the type of analysis and the analysis approach you're doing, it may be that just because there is a mention of something that's not necessarily correlated to a particular weight. What I mean by that is, how significant is it that somebody mentioned something that was unsurprising? Or how significant is it that somebody once mentioned a vulnerability? If we rely just on the number of times that we have coded something, it could just be that one person talks about that theme a lot, even though it's not really very important to them. And it may be that because we've coded that a lot, we start to assume that that person feels that vulnerability is very important to them. When actually it just shows like that because it's something they spoke about many times. Someone else may have just mentioned their vulnerabilities once and actually have broken down in tears about it. They were so upset. But without any kind of waiting, relying just on the number of times a particular theme is used or a particular code is used, can misrepresent the data, which is another reason why it's always important to go back and read. We're not trying to quantify this data in most of these analytic approaches. We're trying to find different ways to read it and different tries to understand the data. Sometimes the quantification can help, but in general, it's easier to go back and read the data. Now, one of the things that's happened in this project here is we've actually turned these numbers on here, which shows how many times a particular code is used. So I generally have these off. You can choose this in the view, show number of codings, and then we get this kind of clearer view because I don't really want to rely on the numbers of times that something has, has, has occurred so often in this type of analysis. So I'll talk a little bit in a minute about some of the other types of analysis where that might be more appropriate. Okay, let's, Okay, uh, let's, there's just a couple of questions here that have come through that which are really good. How do we know that we've made sufficient themes and sub themes? Nothing relevant is missed out to get the actual outcome. How to know if I'm going wrong or missing something which impacts the results of my study? Such a good question. And it's such a, it's, it's such a difficult one to answer. Generally, this is where an iterative approach is very useful. It's, in, in my experience, I always have bad luck. Uh, and what will happen is I will read through the whole of all of the data and I'll come to the very last interview. And in the last interview, someone will talk about, let's, let's say job security. And suddenly it appears in my head, oh, okay. Job security is actually the most important thing people are talking about. They didn't explicitly call it job security, but I now see that everybody was talking about job security, but I only created this code in the last interview I looked at. What do I do now? Well, you probably have to go back and read it all over again and find all the instances of job security and put it in that code. And that sounds like a horrible process, but it's pretty rare for that not to happen at least once. What I mean is to read through the data once and then want to go through and read it again having created your codes the first time. 
Now, depending on what analytical approach you take, that's very common in the gravity theory approach. It's very rare in a framework analysis approach. But there is, it's, it's, it's common to miss things. And it's common to, more than missing things, for things not to be very obvious until you've spoken to many people. Um, especially because people in this kind of research, for example, is a great example, will have different ways of talking about their life story, different ways about talking about their life journeys. And they may not even be conscious themselves of things like, like job satisfaction um, in a way that they will explicitly express it. It's something that is a subtext, something that you need to pull out of the data. They won't say, I am unsatisfied with my job because of my pay. But you may see somebody says, well, yes, it's okay working in academia, but I really wish it paid more. That's kind of the same thing, but it's kind of a subtext. And then they may not even say that, that clearly. They may say, I really love working in academia, but I struggle to provide for my family. It's, like it's, it's something else. Or I really like working in academia, but uh, I don't get enough time outside of work. I'm always working, trying to keep the pennies rolling in. You so see, you have all these different ways that people will talk about things. And that's why very careful, close reading of the data is so important. It can help prevent you kind of missing things until too late. But the other thing is, don't feel that it went wrong if there was something you had to go back and do. All I can say is this happens to me all the time. Uh, it's one of the things that make it so slow. Uh, and one of the things that you shouldn't be too upset. It is upsetting, but you shouldn't be too upset with if it happens in in your analysis. You have to go back and, and find another code, find another theme and try again. Uh, also asked, is there any exception report generated automatically shows error or anything like that? Not that shows error, but I'll show the reports that come up later. Which of the, someone asked, asks, which of the following analysis Quercos can make? Sentiment analysis, discourse and discursive analysis, in addition to the interviews that we've just discussed. So yes, so you can you can do all of these things manually, but you need to create these codes and themes manually. So you can absolutely do sentiment analysis. Um, I'll open a project just now where I've done a lot of sentiment analysis. Uh, actually, I did very basic sentiment analysis in this project. I just coded pretty much everything that anybody said to positive and negative. Um, and I did this manually, but it's so enlightening. It's so enlightening because with that overlap view, I can now right click on this negative bubble here, show the overlap view, um, and it shows me everything that people said that was negative in some way. And this particular project is looking at uh, political parties in Scotland. So apologies if it's, if it's, um, it, it's a little bit, um, of, a, of a strange foreign country. But uh, what it clearly shows is that the, the UK Labour Party was the th one of the things that people had the most negative things to say. And that was such a revealing finding to be able to break it apart in this way. So sentiment analysis is very powerful. Discourse and discursive analysis. Yes, so you can do those as well. What I'm trying to show here is um, just the kind of the basic tools that Quercos will allow you to use to apply any kind of type of analysis. And whether you're going to do a lot of um, sentiment analysis, you're going to do discourse analysis, or in other words, looking very carefully, we kind of did a bit of discourse analysis, a kind of how people are talking about themselves, the type of language they're using, how they're representing themselves. You can do all those different types of analysis using these codes and themes and groups to kind of build up that picture and build up that model. So I'm just going to go back to the Qualitative Researcher Journey project again. Okay, um, we've got another couple of really good questions, so I'm going to engage with those. Please keep these coming, these, these are really good. Um, so someone asks, in cloud, if different minds are looking at the same data, code the same data differently, how will Quercos behave and resolve? Very good question. Um, it's very common for people to want to do this because this kind of qualitative analysis is very interpretive. So sometimes you don't want to rely on just one person's interpretation of the data. You want to pull in um, lots of different people to see if they you know, interpret it the same way or they have different ideas or, or create different codes and themes. 
So when you're working on one project and other people are working at the same time, it's quite fun because you'll see things kind of popping up and people will move things and add different things. What Quercos does is it will, um, every time somebody adds a piece of text to a code or creates a code, it records who created it and when. But what that means is at any time you can see who worked on the project um, and who did what particular pieces of work. I'm going to show you in a minute how you would get a view for that. How does Quercos resolve that? So, so it is possible for um, different people to interpret the same data in the same way, and it will show both of those. But there's also a view which will show you just one person and one person next to another. So you can see the differences between it. It's a very good question. How will Quercos resolve that? That resolve word is very important. And the answer is Quercos will not resolve that at all. And there's a very simple reason for that in that Quercos cannot understand why you had that difference of opinion. Only yourselves can really understand that difference of opinion. It's something that you need to have a conversation about. And collaborative analysis, I always think is, is really about generating those conversations because it's those conversations where people disagree or not disagree, but have, you know, different interpretations of what they mean. You know, we had different ideas about what the code should be, how they should be worded. It's those conversations where we try and, you know, uh, yeah, we, 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 we try and make our case for why we think it should be one way and the other person makes a case the other way. And hopefully someone is open to having their mind changed, but it's those discussions that will help us understand better the data and the codes. So it will show you those differences, but it will not resolve them. That, that is up to you. And then you can choose which of those you want to keep. You can remove it from one of those. You can choose which code you want to keep. So that's generally how that works. And when you're working together, that's a very important part of the process. And it's something that I always urge people not to wait just till the very end to do. They should be having those conversations as they go along, uh, because otherwise it will be a very long time before you realize you've been doing things very differently uh, and you might want to all be on the same page much sooner than that. Um, the last question I have here is, is it possible to draw lines among categories in order to reveal their inner relationship? And is it possible to club the categories once created? It's a very good question. Unfortunately, Quercos cannot show lines. It's very, uh, other software does. So, uh, Atlas TI, Max QDA in particular, and MVivo will allow you to draw lines to define relationships between different codes. Quercos does not support that. The only way you can show those relationships is with the subcategories, so putting the bubbles on top of each other like this, and then also the uh, groups. Uh, oh yes, we've got groups in here. Um, so those are the only ways that we can kind of create those um, relationships. So we can, can club categories together using the groups, and you know rearranging them again with these subcategories um, but we can't currently draw lines um, in the current version of Quercos. I would love to be able to support that that soon. Okay so what I'm going to do now is just show you a couple of other things then I'm going to show you some of the outputs and then there'll be time at the end for a few more questions. So the next thing I'm going to show you we looked at some of the relationships between the codes now I want to look at some of the relationships between the different participants. I want to look at some of the different groupings that we have um, and how we can look at those. Oh, great, okay. So um, what I'm gonna do is click here on the query view. We've not looked at this yet, but this is one of the kind of, I think kind of most uh, useful and flexible features in Quercos. And it allows us to run queries on the data basically based on anything that's in the project. What we're gonna start with here is looking at the properties. So the first button here shows all the different things that we can run a query on. So we can run a query on the properties. So the source properties are the things here like gender, the highlight author, the quirk author. But this is why I was talking about earlier when someone asked about how we can um, show the differences between different people working on the project. We can show all the work done by one person and all the work done by a different person. We can show the highlight. So that's when they assigned a particular piece of text to one code and the quirk author, so who created a code. And then we can see whether those codes need to be merged together or worked in a different way. 
We've also got the dates here, uh, highlight date, quirk date. We've got groups, um, so we can look for a particular group and source title. So if we wanted something from one particular title. The first thing I'm going to look at though is the properties. Um, and just as a very basic thing, we're going to look at the prop The first property is gender. We can change the different ones here. We have location, discipline, and then we'll have equals. We've got all the different operands here and we'll have female. So I'll click on update. And here are the results now from just the, the women in the project that we interviewed. And we'll see the most common thing they talk about 47 times is vulnerabilities. We don't want to rely on that too much, but it's okay. So we'll look through and we can read all the different things that just the women said about the vulnerabilities. But we can also use this comparison view mode here. We can split the screen in half, and then we can update the query to show the results from the women on the left side of the screen and the men on the right. And actually, vulnerabilities is the thing that the men talk about most as well. So there's not a kind of gender difference here. Um, and then actually, the, you can see these are all in descending order of how often they've occurred. Again, we don't really want to rely on this too much, just the number of times that something's been mentioned, because it doesn't show us the significance of each time that they've mentioned something. But they do show here um, that they're pretty much the same things here uh, in the same orders. So the, the themes are quite common, at least are occurring quite in quite common proportions between the different men and the women. But we, what we want to do is read through these now, read to see if um, the women are talking about if the women's messy journeys are different to the men's messy journeys, let's put it that way. Um, or if women have experienced different training gaps to the, the men that we talked to in the project. Or if the women uh, found different things to be surprising. Not that there are more or less things, but if they are more surprising. Uh, we may also want to look, for example, at the discipline. So we've got sociology here. How do the people in sociology compare to the people in education? Um, and we can see, again, what we need to bear in mind is, I don't know in this particular project how many people fall into these categories. We can see those results. I'll show you how in a second, but I, I'm not very familiar with this project. So the vulnerabilities, um, again, is, is the most common thing. We can see whether there's a significant difference. Maybe people in sociology uh, have more vulnerabilities to talk about than people in education. We don't know. We can also compound queries here as well. So maybe we want to see people in sociology who are just women. So you can add more and more variables to these. Um, oh, okay. Well, it didn't change anything. So I guess <laughs> all the people in sociology in this sample were female. So you can keep refining these queries. You can look for lots of different things. Um, and this is a very interesting way to go through and explore the data um, by participant, by their journey. I'm quickly going to show you um, a couple of the other visualizations and some of the other tools, and then I'm going to look at some of the exports. So um, one of the other visualizations that we have here is a word cloud. Now, this is one of the kind of more quantitative metrics. It's usually used in um, a very kind of quantitative discourse analysis. And it basically shows us the number of times a particular word appears in the data. Uh, and the word no seems to be the word that appeared most often. We also have kind, think, so qualitative. And we can customize this in many words. We can remove words that don't occur very often. So we just get the most common ones. Um, maybe no is a bit obvious, so we can remove that one. We've got a list of words, this is stop words here. And we can also choose which sources we want to look at. So maybe the only particular kinds of sources we want to generate the word cloud for. We might want to compare which words are used most commonly in one source next to another. And we can do that by changing the source here. We can save this image when we're happy with it uh, and export it so we can use that in our report or presentation or wherever it needs to go. So the other export options we have, uh, we can create a report of all the data. This is um, a very comprehensive way to look at the data. Uh, it basically gives us all the data on the project itself. So for all the different sources, all the different codes, the relationships between the codes, and also all the different codes uh, for each source and also for each code. So it gives us lots of ways to customize um, the layout of the report and that can be quite useful as well. So we've got this summary table here, for example, of the sources. 
and it shows us these are the titles of the sources, who brought them in and when, how long they are in characters and how many quotes we have in each of them. And then we've got a table here showing us all the different codes here, the relations, the subcategories, um, the long descriptions that we have for each of them, when they were created and how many codes there are in them. We've also got these, uh, the visualizations down here of the um, properties. So it shows us, okay, there's a pretty even gender split actually in this project. Um, and it looks like most people here are in education. Uh, and Oh no, health and education are the same. And then slightly fewer people in sociology. We've got these graphical overviews of the sources. And we've also got graphical views of the codes here too. It's kind of small in this preview, but you can export it as a bigger file. And then below that, you've got all the text. So this is everything in the, the type theme. Um, but we can also have everything in the particular data. Um, and when we've customized this with the different sections that we want to appear, and the different views and visualizations we want to have, we can save it as a PDF, we can print it out, or we can save it as a Word file. But we can also create a Word file of, uh, we can also create a Word file of our transcripts. And what this does is um, it basically creates a standard word file which shows our coding uh, color coded except there's so many overlaps here that doesn't show the colors very well um, so if you want to share the data with someone especially a supervisor or a colleague um, or someone else who doesn't have the software you can create a standard word file here it's just like as if you've gone through with pen and highlighters which is a very common way to do qualitative analysis without software we also have the option here to do um, spreadsheet export. So again, this is, um, somebody's asked, and I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more in a minute about um, uh, text analytic options. Um, and the CSV export, um, the CSV export allows you to bring in the data to SPS or Excel or R, um, and you can do a lot more statistical analysis on the data there. So it will ref it will keep your coding. Um, so for example, we can look at the quirks here. So if you wanted to bring in, um, so here, here we basically have a spreadsheet now with all the codes and themes that we created, the description, uh, how many times they appear in each one. So you can create graphs and summaries of them very easily um, in any kind of spreadsheet software. Uh, we get all the quotes here, all our memos, the chat, all the different sources exported. Um, so you can kind of subcategorize them in different ways. So that's that's a very useful kind of way of that. I'll just briefly come into that question. What's your insight in using Python libraries for text analysis, e.g. NLTH, Core NLP, Dynasium, to name a few, uh, natural learning toolkits? Yeah, so, so here's my experience of doing it. We, we have a project with uh, the informatics department of the University of Edinburgh, and we looked at using basically off the shelf Python libraries, just like this, uh, using using uh, NLTK, uh, word to vec and a whole bunch of different approaches to see how good these tools were at qualitative analysis. And the answer was very, very bad for this type of data. These kinds of tools are very powerful when they have hundreds of thousands of sources, uh, which are very short. What we have is a very few sources that are very long and are very in depth. Uh, and so sometimes they're able to identify very basic patterns like Australia um, and uh, jobs and academia even possibly. But it's very difficult to tell these that you're interested in more detail than just academia. Thank you very much. I just like I'd like to know about the sub disciplines as well. Couldn't you tell me about, um, you know, uh, education and things like that as well. And it's pretty hit and miss whether it decides that that's something that it's going to tell you about or not. The real problem with a lot of this type of qualitative analysis is that these 
these um, data sets are trained on particular models. They're trained to do particular jobs, which they can do quite well, like sentiment analysis, very basic sentiment analysis. So if you want to use them, you certainly can get them with good reliability to identify positive and negative sentiment. So if somebody says, I really hate my job, it sees the word hate and it will be able to code it to, that's a negative statement. Um, but then there are certain things that it's very bad at. For example, sarcasm. So if somebody says, oh yes, well, they paid me an extra hundred thousand pounds. I really hate my job now. That will, is obviously sarcastic to us, but um, the, the machine learning algorithm is not able to spot that with any reliability. So that will get misinterpreted in that sense. So there are certain approaches where it can be useful. Most qualitative analysis projects, we're generally working with very small data sets. Those tool sets really struggle to draw anything meaningful out of very small data sets. They need thousands and thousands of sources to get to any level of statistical significance. And they need to be very well trained. You need to understand very well how those algorithms were trained. What they can't do is understand human experience. They can't really understand things like job satisfaction. Um, and they can't generate new ideas and theses for you. They can help categorize the data in a very basic way. So it can be a useful first step, but they, unless you've got a very simple question, for example, um, are people, which can, you can give a binary answer, are people satisfied with working in academia? That's the kind of thing um, that machine learning approach might be able to help you answer. But if you want to know why, that's a level of understanding of the data that at the moment, these algorithms just don't have that level of nuance. Um, it may be something in the future, which, which um, helps. There's something that we're always looking at, um, but at the moment, those, those I mean, we've not found, even with kind of, you know, working with, with state of art groups and universities, uh, the, the current state of the art to be very, very helpful for. So I hope that, that that helps a little bit. That's that's my own kind of limited insight into those tools. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> what I've done now is kind of given you a brief overview of the software, some basic kind of analytical approaches which are common to different interpretive means. There's not enough time today to kind of go through all the different ways that we might want to interpret the data. So all the different coding approaches. What I would recommend is that um, you can look on our blog, it's a good place to start. There are specific blog post articles looking at lots of those different um, interpretive uh, methods. So for example, there is one on discourse analysis and there's one on uh, constant comparative analysis, which is one of the things I've been looking at recently. There's one on um, doing IPA with examples in, in Quercos. Um, you can basically spend a day doing or at least a two hour workshop session just looking at one of those. Um, and it's there isn't really one kind of analytical approach that's right for everyone or everyone's source of data. So it's useful to go and see all the different approaches which are out there, maybe try them a little bit, read about them a little bit, and then see which one is going to work best for your research question, the type of data you have, and also how you kind of like to work and interpret the data. The last thing I'm going to do now is just talk about some of the ways that the software can help us uh, write up data. Um, and to do that, I'm actually going to go back to um, the other project which I had open here, the one on uh, politics in Scotland, uh, just because this was one of my research projects, so I know this one a little better. <clears throat> so I'm coming up to write my report now. I've kind of pretty much finished my analytical approach. Um, and how does the software, how does going through all this how is this going to help me with the writing up process? Well, one of the most useful things that, that the qualitative software does is just kind of keep track of everything. So for example, I want, might want to write a, a section on my project, which is about politicians and politics, about the charisma of a particular politician, you know, how important the charisma is uh, that they've got, you know, a nice personality and that they come across in the media very well. How important is this for my data? So I will start Word, and I'll start writing up my section heading. On what I can do in the software is I can go through, sorry, 
and find all of the different things, all the different times which I coded some text as being about charisma. And I can select them with this little tick box here. So any way you get a view, this includes the query view, you can tick to select the quotes that you have. And when you've selected all the ones you're happy with, um, and there's a button here to select all of them if you want, you copy them here, copy to the clipboard, and then you can paste them into Word. Um, and they come into Word with the attribution as well, so you know which source it came from. So Jim said, I think the feature of the independence campaign is something extent. And so um, these quotes are something that will help us write up our, our section about charisma in this case. Um, we will use some of these examples to illustrate the finding we have. So our finding might be, we think that charisma, the people we spoke to think it's a very important factor for whether they're going to like a political party or not. So they have a charismatic lead. And we can show some examples of different people um, and how they've talked about charismatic, you know, sometimes literally and sometimes not. Uh, comes across as sensible, good at putting things across. So we can use that to, to help um, not just do the writing up, but also to um, um, illustrate what we found. So we want to provide some examples. And one of the other things that I've talked about briefly a couple of times is the use of meta themes, meta codes. What I mean by that is I have this code here, which is called key quotes. Um, and it's not actually really a, you know, like a proper code or a theme. It's actually just um, it's something that I've gone through and done uh, every time I found a quote that was so good, you know, I didn't want to miss it. Um, and these key quotes are the ones that I'm probably most likely to use um, when writing up the data. Um, these are the ones <laughs> I was willing to vote yes because I thought the no sides arguments were so cool. So these were what I kind of thought were the best things that, that people say. You know, those those times that people say something you think would be, you know, the subheading to an article or it's really going to help you put that together. And so remember that really what these software packages do is help you organize and manage the data. So if you're thinking about what the process you need to do to write up your data is going to be, doing something like keeping key quotes can be a really useful tool to help you speed up the writing process. You can just go to your key quotes. And remember, you can use the overlap view here as well. So we could right click and show the overlap view for the key quotes. And we can see all the times. So I want my key quotes on the no campaign. I want my key quotes on charisma. So I want to go to those best quotes about charisma. And I can do that really quickly and easily uh, because I tagged those key quote things as I went along. I might also use meta codes to tag bits of text that I don't understand and I want to come back to, something that's not clear, or somebody talked about something and I'm not really sure what they mean. I often use it for times where people contradict themselves. So if somebody says, yeah, yeah, I, I really love my job, but then later on, like, yeah, I'm so sick of working in academia, that's quite a contradiction. And I want to kind of highlight those so I can come back and look at them later. And that's another way that I might use meta codes to help me explore that data. Um, okay, so uh, that's pretty much everything that I was going to, to demonstrate today as a kind of like basic overview. I want to leave lots of time for questions because the questions have been so great so far. Also, let me know if there's any particular um, functionality or particular feature that you want to see or you have any other questions about the operation. Um, and I'm just going to jump into the questions now. So. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, I really appreciate the entire thing that you have given to us. The, um, the basic things uh, which are maybe seen uh, in Kirk course and uh, you know that gives you a very good understanding as to how the tool is going to work for us. Now um, first of all I would ask uh, participants to go ahead and uh, raise some more questions for Daniel if you have. If not then um, Ramani will start asking Daniel a few of the questions. Now, as they are no uh, going to, um, okay, there was one question, uh, I think, by Kanan, um, you know, one of our participants, a very active person. He has asked a question to you, Daniel, what, is, what are, it should be, your insights on using Python libraries for 
text analytics like uh, NLTH, Core, NLP, Algorithm to name of. Are you planning to uh, collaborate with them? I think that is what he hints. Or maybe he is asking you, uh, you know, how you are going to talk about that. Yeah. So I did answer that question a bit. So we did talk about that. Um, and basically, my finding is that we we worked with some people who were experts in that field. And we found it very useful for basic things like sentiment analysis, but very difficult for um, high level qualitative analysis. So trying to understand very complex things, for example, like job satisfaction, very difficult to use those tools to understand the human experience or to do any type of kind of grounded theory. But if you're looking to find very basic things like um, every time somebody mentions something negative, then those tools can help. And obviously, one of the things you'll appreciate from doing this type of analysis is it's a very manual process, choosing which codes to create, uh, which pieces of text to go through, and going through all of the text and seeing everything in there. It's a very slow process. So it can be very tempting to use some of these tools. The export options we have here will help you do that. If you specifically want to do this, do get in touch because we do have scripts that will allow you to take these directly into um, NLTK. Um, and you can use Quercos as a kind of intermediary step to create codes and themes and then have NTLK populate them. For us, it's not worked particularly well. We're working with some other people. We might add that functionality later in the future as kind of like a, a, as a kind of automatic add-on. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. And now I'm asking you a question. Now, um, as far as I have seen the entire uh, session of yours focusing more on coding, uh, you know, how we can understand the, uh, uh, you know, intricacy, nuances in it. And, you know, it, it, it is very beautiful. So does that mean that this focuses Kirkos as a software for qualitative research more on text analysis, number one? Number two, for uh, interviews that you are going to um, take, conduct? And does that include for the various uh, traditional qualitative methodologies like focus group and uh, phenomenology, uh, ethnography, grounded theory also it includes or is there a separate way that you are going to introduce uh, in Kirkos? It's a really good question. So yes, our focus is really on text sources. So some of the other software will allow you to work directly with audio and video. For this, I mean, if you're doing something like an interview or a focus group, you can work with it in Quercos, um, but you need to have it transcribed first. And there are automatic transcription services that you can use. Some are better than others. Um, they're getting pretty good now, but generally you will need to transcribe the data or have it transcribed before you can bring it into Quercos. We find that most qualitative researchers doing these kind of research projects will get transcripts of at least most of the data anyway because they will need those quotes and things to help them write up. And because it's it's actually a lot quicker to read than to listen. Um, you know, I can read, my general rule of thumb is I can read the transcript of a, an hour long interview in about 15 minutes, but it takes me an hour to listen to. So it's, it's a lot quicker, especially to try and find particular bits of it once you have a transcript, it's very useful. But absolutely you can work with with focus group data as well, once it's been transcribed. And we have lots of people that do ethnography as well. Well, they'll keep in their own notes, their observations and things like that. And they will bring those in and code and interpret and analyze them. And yes, you can also do different types of grounded theory. Again, we try and make these tools in Quercos quite general. Um, as I said, on the blog, you'll find lots of different um, specific guides for specific types of analysis like IPA and a particular different types of grounded theory, um, but generally it can be applied for most of these different things. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, uh, next question I wanted to ask you is that qualitative research is very closely associated to social networking analysis, right? Now, the transcriptions I can understand. However, is there a way in which I can pull the data directly from the social networking platforms like uh, Facebook or uh, let's say if I'm doing um, analysis of a film in terms of film analysis, documentary analysis, 
so YouTube so those things uh, using AI can I capture that information directly into a course also so that I can proceed further with the um, you know once I have that data into a course that turns out to be my text and then I can go ahead is that that leverage also available for us right now so that's quite limited so what you can do is you can copy and paste mm -hmm. from social media like Facebook and Twitter um, and you can create sources that way that can be quite useful some of the other qualitative software I have to be honest has more powerful tools than doing that generally the issue is that the social networks now restrict the APIs quite a lot mm -hmm. so it's very difficult that you not Facebook for example doesn't allow researchers anymore to extract a lot of data directly from Facebook. They don't like people doing that. Um, the same with YouTube. Um, what's really useful is you can export the auto-generated transcripts from a lot of YouTube videos, and that can be a very useful way to quickly get summary of, as you said, if you're doing analysis of a film or something. But again, Facebook, sorry, YouTube is quite restricted on the API, so it's not possible for us to directly connect to, a, to YouTube and get that data. Uh, you know, they want to keep all that information on their own platform now so they can show you some ads. Um, so they don't allow researchers that kind of access anymore, which is a shame. But do look, some of the other software packages have got a lot more specialist tools for looking at social media. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Daniel. And uh, next question for me is, um, apart from English, is the software uh, friendly with other languages also? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yes, so so um, I think I only have examples here. Oh, here's one in Japanese. But yeah, Quirkus will work with, with uh, any type of script. Um, so um, you can import, um, yeah, any kind of languages you have. You can have them also mixed within particular um, projects. So, so you don't have to have... Right. Hmm? So that means even Indian languages also, like Hindi, yes, Telugu, Kannada right yes and yes absolutely okay. and mixed within the sources as well which is something a lot of the other software can't allow you to do mm -hmm. so it would be quite common where you would have people speaking hindi and then some of the questions might even be in english, english um, right. and there's not a problem in quirkos you can have different languages within the same source mm -hmm. and you can have the codes and the descriptions anything in quirkos can be uh, in, in any language in any script I'm seeing that there is a lot of, uh, you know, textual analysis. Now, there is one another popular area of uh, qualitative research, and that is narrative analysis, mm. conversation analysis, discursive and discourse also. So these kind of analysis also can I uh, go ahead and uh, use a purpose for those analysis? Yeah, absolutely. So when you're doing something like discourse or narrative analysis, so narrative analysis, you're looking for people to tell them, tell you kind of their story, their journey. Discourse analysis, you're looking very kind of closely at the kind of words and terminology that people are using. It's basically just, it will affect how you create the codes and how closely you read the data. Uh, a lot of time in discourse, you know, um, you know, discourse analysis, I find myself coding, you know, just individual words and phrases a lot. Um, and of course, you can do this in Quirkos. You know, we create a code which is professional life. So we can do it that way. So again, all of these tools should be flexible enough that you can apply any of these different narrative or discourse analysis. Um, there are blog post articles specifically on each of those on the website. Um, I can try and find one for you. There's definitely one on narrative example analysis, for example. Uh, and each of those would talk a little bit about um, uh, the, the kind of the general method, uh, but then also kind of applying it in Quirkos as well. So, so here on the blog is, oh, sorry, it's on, on, on a different screen. Uh, so here on the blog, here's, here's the article on uh, discourse analysis. And so it talks a little bit about um, what it means some different definitions, lots of references at the end as well. And there are, a lot, of course, lots of different exam different types of discourse analysis as well. So it talks about some of those differences. There's also some examples. I actually quite like this, this article. Um, 
And then there's also some discussion at the end about how you would actually do it in Quercos. Um, so the blog is a very useful um, resource to, to, to find uh, more information about some of these more specific uh, methodologies. So there's, there's one here on constant comparative method. Um, there's one on a grounded theory and a priori framework analysis, a content analysis here, as well as some kind of general ones about um, researchers researching um, and um, you know, writing up qualitative data and all those things. So hopefully those will be a very useful resource as well. Yes, that's right. Yes, now I can see the entire picture now, which is very nicely fitted um, into Curve Course. Um, so definitely, yes, it's a very good tool. Uh, congratulations, first of all, that yes, we were able to um, get an idea as to how to use this particular uh, software in various schools of qualitative um, analysis as well as for the research also. So I think in-depth training is what is required. Today we just got the introduction from you, uh, Daniel. Um, I think uh, there is a lot of scope for each one of us who is um, particularly, uh, you know, looking at the uh, text data that is available for us. You know, there is so much of this data and then, uh, you know, each one of us can use it um, in different ways that you have shown. And I think uh, this kind of bubble visualization really helps us a lot to understand what exactly is going on between the, um, uh, you know, in one way, yes, it is one on one. However, again, you are trying to showcase to me the multiple realities also is a typical interpretivism school that we are looking forward in qualitative research. So I think I should thank you for giving us such a, uh, I mean, some of your valuable time today, number one, number two, and even um, taking that much of effort to show us line by line in, uh, I mean, this is a wonderful way that I can see that, yes, it's confidential, then you are even date on which the data is being transcribed, who is the interviewer, who is the respondent. Yeah, I mean, each and every detail is available for us. Now, uh, one more qu question to you so that the participants are, now is it multiple user or single user software? For example, uh, there is this particular team. Now, can uh, the team work together or is it that one individual only have to work on core calls and the data has to be recorded in some other fashion? No, no, so it is, it is yeah, multiple user. So with the cloud version at least, everybody can log in and work on the same project at the same time. Okay. And there's no restriction to the number of projects you can collaborate on or the number of collaborators that you can have on the project. And you can work live in real time. If you're only using the offline version, you can still work together, but you will have separate files and you just have to merge them together when you've both gone away and done your analysis and your coding. Thank you. Thanks a lot, David. I really appreciate it, the way that you have explained. And I'm pretty sure that some of the participants from this workshop are now go going to, uh, I mean, they have learned and they have got that um, understanding as to why Kirkos as a software for qualitative research. And this is a wonderful way to get the introduction about it also side by side. So I think I have to thank you for that, completely giving us some of your valuable time to us. So thank you. And I would be inviting you once again later on um, after this workshop is over. And I will definitely get back to you also with more details in that. All right, thank Wonderful. you. Thank, you, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here and I hope it's been useful in some way. Yes. Please get in touch if you have any questions or there's anything I can help with. Yes, definitely, Daniel. I will definitely get back to you. So will some of the participants also. Thank you for joining Wonderful. us. Up. Take care. Bye. And wish you better. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. So thank you um, participants. I think uh, we have got a wonderful uh, session today uh, wherein he showcased to us another different uh, tool in which we can go ahead and work, uh, you know, uh, focusing on uh, text analysis in different manners. Yes, Yasha, please go ahead, first of all. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, 
can we get the opportunity to you know practically have hands on experience and work on such kind of like you know interviews and do coding just for a small piece i think it would help to build you know more skills in us because as far as you know past two sessions i have been watching no doubt i get info about the software and what the software can do and all but personally like for me who have been been so much done you know qualitative research before so is it possible we can get some hands on experience of a you know a smaller interview if you could give a sample file and i can just practically do that yes i will uh, request um, the upcoming sessions and the in, uh, the individuals who are going to take up uh, especially um, you know some of them um, would definitely will be able to help you out yesha so max qda i can um, now i can uh, literally go ahead and showcase also that i'm there very much um, on their um, forum also if you give me a chance maybe i can go ahead and they have already given to me i'm just sharing it the access to that so i can request them uh, to give you a small hands on experience in their uh specially this is their website and you can see i'm now a full time max qda professional trainer and they have given me the complete right and here this is on their website itself and they have uh, taken me up and they have already started giving me um, a lot of um, i would say projects also so maybe uh, you know after uh, giving you all some kind of an exposure and some of you who are going to be uh, with us for a long time when i say uh, with me in the sense that uh, you know we can go ahead form that particular team that i was uh, thinking about and now when i'm there even on kalpas you will be seeing uh, maybe after 3 4 days uh, my name also is coming up so yasha um, that's what daniel and all these people said um it would be like you know he is a very busy person definitely yes so you know he has trained me like there are four five individuals one person like for india it would be me who would be taking up uh, for for course so obviously there would be a hands on session for you um and that would be coming up as to not only just uh, looking at the software that's what if you remember i told you every software has got its own a uh, methodology its own uh, process and philosophy to go ahead and work upon it and that's the reason why i'm raising those questions for each one of you so yasha yes it would be there however since this is a month long um as an introduction to qualitative research wherein my um, idea was to give away to Uh, at least these 50 individuals now i don't see those 50 individuals only the serious uh, individuals are only 35 in number uh, because i'm keeping that data uh, you see i'm a pakka qualitative and a quantitative researcher so for me that data is really important and i'm seeing how many of individuals and what kind of initiatives what kind of work each one of you are uh, into this particular workshop also side by side you see so that uh, really motivates us to take you for the long run correct so definitely yasha yasha i am into that process um, this workshop is going to end on 13th of february and then immediately as you have seen my um, workshops results are also coming up along with that um i'm coming up with one more workshop and another uh, because there has been a lot of request coming in that we have missed the opportunity of joining this one month uh, workshop can you please um come up with another one month so you know i would be uh, taking care so all 35 of you are the first uh, batch i should say who has learned so much and i don't know whether i would be able to invite again these individuals back to the forum uh you know so they have said that ramni we have given you we have trained you you are there now please go ahead and take care so definitely yes as i told you uh while my conversation or over the phone um maybe some time ago wherein i told you that yes i'm looking forward for the classroom sessions wherein it's not uh, just uh looking at the data or uh, you know or going away now for these kind of a things um max qda person who is going to join us up tamara i will request her to give us uh, maybe on something so that you are able to do it otherwise 
um, maybe after February 13th, Yasha, I would be coming up with almost, I should say, um, other workshops wherein these ones would be dealt in depth. You know, he hasn't shown you how to, um, you know, import the data, how many files has to be there, how you are supposed to arrange. Even these things are also exactly. required. Right yes. now, what he has done is he has shown you how the purpose is working and, you know, rather than that discrete coding. Now, if you will see in vivo or Atlas TI or um, let's say the other textual, um, I should say, uh, the software which are coming, everybody has got a different style of doing it. Now, Karkos here, they have shown you that bubbles and the way the uh, outcome is going to come in a different manner. If you remember yesterday when there was this workshop with David, I asked him another question. Uh, remember, I said that is there any quantification, the numbers that are going to attach it? He said, no, I'm not. I'm not in that favor. However, Ramini, you have to give me a strong reason why you think it should be there. Then I will go ahead and introduce it in my software. You understood now. So, you know, when we are working, we are working like a, a full family and one to the other. So, you know, uh, definitely, yes, David has taken me up as his student and then he's also giving me the training. Uh, uh, Daniel is a very good friend of mine. So, definitely, instantly, you know, I, he did not even take a minute also to think over that should I uh, say yes to her uh, session also or not. Now, similarly, the other person whose uh, poster I uh, flashed out today in the group, you will see he took exactly three minutes for the first time. Uh, to adore, you know, I was interacting with him only through the mails and mails and mails. And today, uh, when we had the conversation face to face, he said, I never knew that there was somebody in India who's taking up the workshop in such a serious manner. Now, you know, when I looked at him, I said, sir, please, India is not such a bad country. And we are very serious kind of individuals who are doing it. Now, you know, so these kind of a things are there for Yasha. So definitely, yes, in future. Um, you have seen, yes, it has taken almost uh, two and a half years for me to come up with this online workshop. However, yes, uh, slowly, steadily, let's see. I never expected Corona to be there for such a long time. Otherwise, classroom sessions and those are the best where we go literally outside into the field and, you know, make you understand what is happening inside the brain once we are back from that interview. Now, you see, Michael, when he's going to join us up, I don't know, for mixed methodology, he is the one. And he was also asking me, what do you want me to do? I said, sir, both qualitative and quantitative, which is equals to mixed methodology. So he started laughing and he said, because he comes from the medicine field. So, you know, for him, every day a patient is like a um, data for him. And that's why you see for us. Uh, that's why he was focusing more on the uh, textual data, saying that, uh, uh, you know, that some of us who are working on annual reports or the literature uh, that is available in the form of the prior literature. So definitely, yes, this thing takes a lot of time for us also. But anyway, I have taken up your suggestion. Um, forthcoming uh, workshop, I have requested some of them to give to us also side by side. Uh, Max QDA most probably is sharing. So some of you who have already downloaded Max QDA on your systems, which are like a uh, second ones I'm talking about, I hope all of you get the message. Remove them because uh, they are going to already they have because now I'm a professional trainer. They would be giving me that uh, I have already got the username and the password. However, for all of us together to give it uh, at least for 35 who were regular. Uh, to these sessions, I would definitely go ahead and give it Yasha for uh, Max QDA. For others, let me talk uh, because Lexi Man Manser is there, then Hyper Research from Massachusetts, from Harvard University, they are joining up. And today, uh, you know, in the most probably, I would be uh, closing that particular um, uh, uh, in the sense that uh, when the date is there, they have to tell me. And, uh, you know, Harvard University is again a center for 
qualitative research and they are doing it very seriously. So you can understand that when I'm introducing these individuals, there is that hope uh, from their end also. India, which is so rich in diversity, would be able to capture some kind of a data and then we, uh, all of us together, you know, in some form or the other form can collaborate and definitely come up with wonderful papers. If not immediately down the line, uh, I am uh, looking, um, you know, the, so some of you who are serious and then we can join up and we can test for it. Okay, so with that, I'm Thank closing you, this session. Yesha, yes, so it would be there. So Max QDA day after tomorrow. Tomorrow is deduce and this lady, Sarah, is also wonderful. I will uh, just speak to her and ask her if she can mail us few of the uh, whatever she's planning and she can give us a hands-on uh, experience also for that day in that manner. Okay, these two ladies I can request. Thank so you, ma'am. All right, so till then, good night, take care, and I'll see you people again tomorrow. Take Thank you, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Apurva. Bye. Oh, wow.